All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning to you all. Thanks for joining me. Uh, today's actually kind of a milestone day. We, uh, we make our first pivot in the class. So thus far, we've talked entirely about Photoshop and working with photos and post-processing and then combining images together with masks, et cetera. Uh, and today we're actually going to move from Photoshop into Adobe's next piece of software that we'll discuss in class, and that's Adobe InDesign, which is fundamentally a layout piece of software. This also marks the place in the class where I shift into kind of lecturing and talking a lot about graphic design, layouts, boards, and presenting information. And it's something that's very important to any of the design fields, whether you're in architecture and in industrial design, you're in landscape design, um, or really any of the other design fields, learning how to present your ideas is really critical to really having good ideas and being able to communicate those ideas to people and getting yourself sold as the, the primary provider of a particular design project. And so we're gonna spend a lot of time in InDesign kind of going through all of those. Today, we'll start with the very basics. All of that being said though, it's not a place where we just forget everything we learned. And so it's my expectation that when we move into InDesign and you work in InDesign, you're taking your photos and you're doing post-processing, you're giving yourself the best images, you're doing the Photoshop techniques that we've discussed, and then just applying them along with the new InDesign techniques. So it's not something where we break and you forget everything that we've done. It's a really a building block. So we've done Photoshop, now we're gonna move into InDesign. And you'll actually find that as we go forward in the class, a lot of things fold back on themselves. Like we'll come back into Photoshop some more, we'll come back into InDesign some more, we'll come back into Illustrator some more. So they're really designed to all mix together uh, and build upon each other. So um, we're gonna start today with a kind of a basic lecture on graphic design. And then we'll move into doing some kind of preliminary work in InDesign. I'll walk you through the InDesign program and you'll get yourself kind of started with the world of InDesign. So let me uh, share my screen and then we'll get organized here. Perfect. And let's get that keynote going. There we go. So I call this lecture Graphic Design 1. This is about function, inspiration, process, and intuition. So we're going to build all of that together, kind of with the building blocks of graphic design. So what is first off, what is the function of graphic design? And why is it important that we have graphic design in the first place? Well, really, it's about communicating. It's about how do you communicate a particular piece of content, whatever that is, through a juxtaposition of your words and your pictures on a page. So how do you cleanly present an idea? How do you invite somebody to be interested in your idea by how you organize it on the page? You could argue that it's a visual synthesis of what your thought process is. Design objectives. We could come up with a lot more uh, than just this list. But generally speaking, this covers a lot of the big ones. Guidance, persuasion, encouragement, communication, maybe just communicating an idea. Maybe it's motivation, it's getting somebody to do something. Maybe it's about education, teaching somebody something. Could be about creating a dialogue. Inspiration, promotion, general information, awareness, direction. Maybe it's just about entertainment. All of those are good design objectives. And like I said, we could come up with a list that was much, much longer than that, but I'm giving you just the sense for where we're going with this. And of course, I'll mix in some graphic design pages along the way. So first off, let's talk about establishing the function of your design. So fundamentally, what is the purpose of your design? It could be an invitation, could be a poster, maybe it's a book. What's the primary objective? So let's use the poster as an example. So let's say you put a poster on the wall. What's the objective of that poster? Well, maybe it's to get somebody to go to a particular event, to make somebody aware of a particular event. That's a major objective. Then we think about audience. Well, who are you trying to get to go to the event? Who are you trying to persuade to do something? That's your audience. And then what is your de desired reaction? Well, in the case of this, that they actually come to the event or they actually do what you're asking them to do. So sometimes if we lay out what these steps are, what's the objective, who's the audience and what's your desired outcome or desired reaction, it gets you started with this design process. 
It is the designer's responsibility to create strong communicative experiences that support the function of design on behalf of the client and floor for the viewer. So there's a lot to kind of unpack here. Let's look at some of the details. It's your responsibility as the desi designer to, to create a strong message or experience that support the function of design. And then here's critical right here on behalf of the client. So you're doing it for someone else, right? You're doing it on behalf of the client. So somebody hires you to do this in the first place, but the client isn't necessarily the person who's going to be viewing this. So it's on behalf of the person who hired you to do the work and it's for potentially somebody else. The person you're trying to get to go to the lecture, the person you're trying to get to go vote. That's that person that you're, uh, that's the, that would be the viewer in this case. So what skills do you have as a designer? Again, these are lists that we could come up with lots, lots more, but analysis, perception, communication, research, management, problem solving, visualization, composition, dialogue, organization, systemization, information gathering, critical thinking, representation are all designer skills. And again, we could have a much, much longer list. So let's take a minute and look specifically at inspiration. So we talk a lot about what inspires you? So if we look at the definition here, it's the process of being mentally stimulated to do something or to feel something, especially to do something creative. So you're excited about doing it. A sudden, brilliant, creative, or timely idea. So how do we cultivate that inspiration? How do you as a designer feel that inspiration? There's nothing worse than not having that spark. So how do we cultivate it? First off, being aware of your surroundings is a great way of finding and being inspired. And frequently, people will walk around with their heads down or their headphones on, and they won't be attentive or observing what's going on around them. In the design world, there's always things that happen. There's always things that we see. And the more you look, the more you'll start to see and the more you'll internalize. So you need to be aware of those surroundings. And I, I, I know it's hard. There are moments when we wake up in the morning and we're tired, we haven't had enough coffee yet. We're just trying to get from point A to point B. Maybe you're trying to get to class, you're trying to get to your job and you're not really thinking about what that inspiration is. At the same time though, if you're aware of the surroundings, you might notice you know, the font choice on the Starbucks door when you walk in. Maybe you notice how the, the sun is passing through a particular window, how it's highlighting some texture. Those little things that you can observe just by being awake and alert and aware can sometimes be the spark for, for something much bigger down the road. So we take this inspiration and we, we kind of cultivate it and we work with it and we transform it into something tangible in our design process. The other thing is that inspiration is very different depending on who you are. So, um, you know, if Iman and I, we, we were walking together and we looked at the same building or we walked through the same building, he would be excited about something different than what I was excited about. And that's normal. Inspiration is something that is unique to the person. And so you, when you experience something, you're going to get something different potentially than your neighbor who's experiencing the same thing. The thing about inspiration is it shouldn't be a chore. It shouldn't require a bunch of extra effort. You're in a creative field. You should be aware of this stuff. It should be popping in your head so that you can't even take it out of your head. It comes from this fundamental desire to create or to communicate ideas. The other thing is don't forget to look inward and tap your own creative inspiration. So if you look inside yourself, maybe there's things you like to do, you like to paint, you like to draw. Sometimes those, just doing those acts can help inspire you. Collecting. All of you should have some kind of a, a way of collecting ideas. And in the old days, this was through a sketchbook. And everybody had a sketchbook, especially in design fields, especially in architecture, you carried around a sketchbook. And I used to do this all the time. Now it's kind of transformed. A lot of people are using electronic means. Maybe your iPad is your sketchbook. Maybe you do your drawing in that. 
Um, but you as a designer fundamentally have to learn how to draw. You have to be able to sketch out ideas. You have to be able to record those ideas. The, the interesting thing is when, the, when we used to have a sketchbook, right? I would say, hey, when you find something that's interesting, you like get it and tape it into your sketchbook. You add it to your sketchbook, kind of comes this collage book, which is really interesting. Now we don't really have that. So instead you're, you know, you're taking a picture with your phone, but all too often that picture with your phone just ends up with all the rest of the pictures. So you got to find a way to put it into your notes or, or actually be able to use it somewhere where you can see it again down the road. So you write notes, you make drawings, you take photographs, and you kind of get that all into your easily accessible medium, whatever that is. Hopefully it's a sketchbook, but maybe it's a digital sketchbook. And then how do you nurture that inspiration? So you carry that device or that camera with you everywhere. So you have your phone, that's great. If you take notes or you draw on your phone, that's even better. Maybe you have an iPad, you carry that with you so you can draw. Maybe you have one of the little pencils so you can draw, etc. Maybe, maybe it's a sketchbook, you carry that with you, right? You become immersed in design. So you look at all the design that's around you. And that's one of the great things about design school is that you're kind of surrounded by this. You're around people that are also interested in design. And so that really can help. You commit to discovering and collecting inspirational factors. So as you walk around, you become aware. You look at all the things that people are doing. You look at the graphic design decisions people are making. You critique those in your head. What could you do better? You want to communicate with other designers. So you want to have a relationship with designers so that you can actually come up with new ideas. A lot of times, the best ideas are when two designers are talking and they're firing ideas back and forth and they're collaborating. That can be a great way of nurturing this inspiration. Now, sometimes you just feel stuck. You don't have an idea. You don't know how to move forward. So what do you do? Well, go out and take a walk. That's a great way of doing it. Maybe you listen to some music. Music has a great way of unlocking your thought process. Explore other areas of interest. So if you're a graphic designer, maybe you go out and you look at product design. Or if you're a product designer, you go and look at architectural design. Sometimes that'll get you unstuck just by shifting scale. Go to lectures, conferences, events. In the spring every year, we put on a lecture series at DVC. Attend those via Zoom. You'd be amazed at how much some other person can inspire your ideas and your thought process just by seeing what somebody else is doing. Exploring, trying something new, all great ways of nurturing that inspiration. Inspiration is always the first step toward whatever that final design is. So we start with that inspiration, we start with that spark, and then we push it forward into a final design. So again, these images that I'm showing you, these are all uh, graphic design pieces. So they're all art that people have done to communicate ideas. So let's talk about this design process. And I'm gonna spend time talking about each one of these steps, but essentially there's seven steps. We have a research phase, we have an information gathering phase, we have kind of a brainstorming phase that leads into a conceptualization phase. We get into some experimentation, then we get into design development, which is where we're fleshing out the ideas and creating that final product, and then we get to the final execution phase, where we're actually uh, showing that final product. The thing about the design process is you can't skip steps. You can't jump from the first piece to the last piece because you'll lose something in the process in the way. And when you lose that piece, your design isn't fully flushed out. So we need to work our way through all these steps. And you can't focus on the final product. You can't know what you want and just go to that because you will have eliminated the design process and you will have cut off many, many ideas that are good. Design is fundamentally an evolution. You should, at the end of a project, let's say that you do a studio project, maybe you're in 121 and you would do an architectural project and you get to the end of your Calder Museum or your Mondrian Museum, after you're done with your presentation, you should be able to say, you know, if I had another week, this is what I'd work on. Because it's fundamentally an evolution. It's always changing. It's never really done. Every step that you do must have your full attention. You need to focus on that step. It can be totally exhausting, but it also can be totally rewarding. And that's part of this design process. It's very different than other majors that you would be in. 
So first off, we start with a program brief. This is the, the very beginning of the design process. It should be a meticulous overview of the project. This is the, the detail of the design. This is what we want. This is the problem we're trying to solve. This is how we're going to deal with that problem, right? It's, it's the, this is kind of the, the basics. This is the backbone of what we're creating. It defines the roles of the designer. What's the designer responsible for? What are they going to be doing? Who the client is, who the viewer is. Remember, we talked about the client, the person who's paying, and the viewer, the target audience. So it defines who those people are. Sometimes it's not as well resolved as you'd like. And it's your job as a designer to seek clarity on what that is. So continuing with that project brief or the program, we need to start with information that's given to you by the client. And this can vary greatly. So in the world of architecture, this is somebody coming to you and saying, I want a new kitchen. And you say, okay, that's great. Talk to me about your kitchen. What would you like to see in your kitchen? Let's define the scope. What's your budget? What are you looking for? So we're clarifying and simplifying that information. And you, the designer, are responsible for asking questions and clarifying to fill in those missing pieces. If we didn't do it, let's use that kitchen example. Let's say somebody comes to me, Paul comes to me and says, I want to do a new kitchen. And I say, okay, that's great. I'm excited that you want to do a new kitchen. I'll go work on a design for you. And I don't communicate with him again until the final project. Well, I have no idea what he's after. What does he like to do in a kitchen? Does he like to entertain? Does he like to cook? Does he want a professional kitchen you know, with huge appliances? Does he want a small kitchen? If I don't ask all of those questions, as the designer, I'm gonna end up presenting an idea that has nothing to do with what he was after. So we need to clarify all those little bits of detail in this early stage. Sorry, it blanked out on me there. There we go. Then we're going to define those primary goals in the world of graphic design. What are the messages to be expressed? Come to the lecture. Go out and vote. Uh, you know, read this new book. So what are the goals? What are any restrictions? This a lot of times has to do with budget. How much money do we have? Can we print in color? Does it have to be in black and white? Those kinds of questions come out. And then what is the timetable for completion? How long do we have to work on this? And then last, we really don't want to define that audience. Who is it that we're trying to target? If we're doing a lecture series poster, for example, who are we trying to get to come to the lecture? How are we going to access that group of people? Then we move into the gathering phase. So that first bit was the project brief, understanding what the project is. Then we move into the gathering phase. This is when we're collecting the, the visual elements that are gonna be used, the text elements that are gonna be used. If there's anything missing, you wanna request it or define who's responsible for creating it. I ran into a problem when I was doing this. This was a large number of years ago. I got asked by a friend to um, put a website together. They were running for a, you know, a council seat. And they said, hey, you know website stuff. Can you put a website together? And I said, sure, no problem. I'll put a website together. And so I put a website together. But then we got to some of the details, like what's your platform? How do you feel about this issue, uh, whatever? And I didn't have anything because they hadn't written anything. So I had to go back to them and say, look, it's not my job to write this information for you. It's your job to give me that information. I'll just put it on the website and organize it and make it look good. So you want to go back. If there's something missing, get it from the client or define who's responsible for creating that missing piece. Then we move into research. And this is actually one of the fun phases. We need to gain an understanding of whatever the topic is that we're working on. Read, evaluate, understand what the materials are. You know, if you're doing a, um, you know, a book, let's say you're designing a book cover, you probably should read the book. Understand what's happening in the book. That's important. Research additional information, review the client's current communication materials. Do they have a specific color? So like DVC, for example, has a specific color green that they use on all their communication materials. They have a specific logo. Make sure you have access to those materials. Investigate competitive markets. So let's say, again, we're doing an lecture series poster. 
what other lecture series posters have been done? What's been done in the past? Evaluate what's been done and use that as some background research and information. Then we get into that brainstorming phase. This is when we're getting all of our ideas out. How are we putting it together? A lot of times this happens in a sketchbook. You're writing down lists of thought. We're building inspiration boards. We like this about this. We like that about that. How do we bring that all together? That's that brainstorming phase. That's the creative process. That's a fun, fun bit. And then we get that brainstorming naturally transitions into a conceptualization phase. This is where we're formulating a plan for the actual project. And the plan is the link between the design, the function, and ultimately the delivery of our graphic design piece. Then we get into experimentation or design development. So when we work through various ideas. So let's say, I'll, I'll jump back to the architectural example here. Let's say somebody comes to me and they want a bathroom. Well, when I get to this design development, right, I already have the inspiration boards, I already have the ideas. Now it's about seeing how this is all gonna fit together. What's this bathroom gonna look like? I'm developing the design. I'm trying different ideas as I work my way through it. So in the world of graphic design, you're doing studies of color, composition, typography. What's the right font choice? We're going to talk specifically at length about font choice soon. Treatments for the illustration, treatments for the photography. Understanding the sequence, varying the sequence. Try something different, insert a different image. Introduce graphic shapes, lines. All of those are this experimentation, this design development. Once we get through that design development phase, we're taking the best ideas from that experimentation phase and the development phase, examining it in close detail and putting it into a final project. I have one key thing that I want to bring to everybody's attention right here. And that's this line, which is the divorce from attachment. And this, if anything, this is the hardest thing you will ever face in the design field. And that is that you work really, really hard on a particular project. You dev devote hours and hours and hours into building this, this project. And you get very attached to the project. You feel like it's right. You've spent all this time. You've worked on it. You've thought of all these ideas. And you end up becoming so attached to it that when somebody else comes in and tries to help you or give you ideas or spark you to think in a different way, you shut down and you stop listening to them. And this happens a lot in reviews, especially when you're young. So when you go to one of those design reviews and you're presenting your ideas and there's a reviewer that comes in, you need to learn to take yourself out of being the presenter and into after I, okay, let's, let, let me back up and let's say that I've, I've come to this review, I've presented my ideas. As soon as I'm done presenting my ideas, I'm going to stop, stand to the side and listen to what everybody else has to say about my project. Rather than just shutting down and saying, I don't want to listen to you, you have nothing good to say. You say, what is it that, that you can give me? And if you actually listen at that phase, which is really hard, you'd be surprised at how much uh, you learn and how many great ideas come out of that little bit of collaboration. The people that come to review your projects have years and years and years of experience. And they're trying to impart that experience onto you. They're trying to help you push your design. They're trying to think about it. Everybody hears the horror stories about the, the reviewer that comes in and they pick up the model and they rip the, the, the top off or they rip the side off and then they put it on the, you know, they flip it over. Well, that's a moment of teaching. That's a moment where you can learn a lot about your design process. So in order to do that, you have to divorce from attachment. You have to almost pretend that it's not your project anymore. So of course it is your project, but stand back and listen to what these people have to say. You're gonna analyze it objectively, Go back, review the project brief. Did you actually solve what you were supposed to solve? And then you eventually produce that final draw that's actually going to be uh, turned into your client or used. Intuition. So we talked a lot about inspiration thus far. Now let's talk about intuition. And it's interesting because these two things kind of go hand in hand, but they're subtly different. So intuition is fundamentally about trusting that inner voice. So you can learn tons of fundamentals of design ideas 
But if you don't trust your intuition, your design is not necessarily going to be good. Good comprehension of techniques does not equal good design. And this is something that's important in this class because we do a lot of skill building. And you may have good comprehension of the techniques. You may understand how to do a levels call. You may understand the rule of thirds. But if you don't execute it in the right way, it can be a bad project. Think back to that rule of thirds. This is a great example. If you crop it so that the person is on the third line and where they're looking has the more space, that works. If you flip it around, you can still satisfy the rule of thirds, but you can have the person looking in two thirds of the space over here and it doesn't work. This is why computers haven't quite gotten to the point, artificial intelligence hasn't gotten to the point where they can solve the design problems without us. Here's that example right here, right? So this works wonderfully. There's our rule of thirds. This still, this image over here follows the rule of thirds perfectly, but it's not a good image. And your intuition should say, this is not a good image. That's where that intuition comes in. So intuition is fundamentally a different level of thinking. It's the complement. It's the piece that is the opposite of rational thought. It comes naturally. It's a gut feeling. People talk about gut feeling a lot. Eh, it doesn't quite feel right. That's this intuition speaking. It allows for thoughts that wouldn't come out of the rational thought process. That's an important distinction. So we have that rational thought process, and then we have the other thought process, the one that's in the back of your head. Intuitive functions, guidance, protection. That's an interesting one. It's there for your protection. It's the red flag. It can be for inspiration and enlightenment. So what are the benefits of intuition? Well, intuition kind of cultivates your imagination. It allows for you to move outside or beyond your comfort zone. It leads to those fresh and innovative ideas. It also increases the number of ideas that are generated. Sometimes it provides that spark that pushes you forward. It says, yeah, that doesn't quite feel right. There it is. That's the one that feels right. Let's move forward with that. The challenges of intuition. You have to allow it to surface without worrying about the final outcome. So you have one side of your brain that's working toward that final outcome. The intuition side is, is the side that's saying, yeah, that works. No, it doesn't work. Maybe you should try this. That other side isn't about the final outcome. It's about doing it right. It takes time to believe your instincts are valuable. That's a big one. As you're a young designer, it takes you time to realize that you have that in the back of your head. Man, that's not quite right. Don't prejudge or abandon those ideas without allowing the idea to mature. Sometimes it's a bad idea. Sometimes the intuition ste steers you off track. But you got to let it kind of create itself. You got to let it push itself into a full-fledged idea before you can abandon it. How do you nurture that intuition? Well, fundamentally, don't be afraid to take risks. Design is a lot about taking risks. It's a lot about putting yourself out there. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. A lot of times in this context, teachers will reward, especially when you're in school, the idea of taking a risk. I give you all the opportunity to redo any assignment over the course of the semester. Well, guess what? That is basically a license to take a risk. You can always do the safe option. You can always come back and do the safe option. But what if you can take that risk and create something that's way, way better than you would otherwise create? So don't be afraid to take the risk. Listen to that inner voice and react to it. Expect the unexpected. Don't overanalyze. If you overanalyze, guess what? It transfers from being intuition into that rational side. So you're not letting that intuition come through. Record your thoughts and collect those visual ideas. Elevate. In the design process, there are things that you think about rationally. 
those that you learn about, and those that you're looking for. And then there is this most interesting part that you cannot be rational about. You just feel it for some strange reason. If you feel right, it will fit into the concept perfectly, and it will make the concept more interesting and unique. So the key here is right there. You just feel it for some strange reason. That fundamentally is intuition right there. So today we're going to work in InDesign and we're going to create some um, kind of preliminary InDesign work. And the, the topic that I'm going to have you create is an album cover. And so it wouldn't be fair for me to just blindly say you need to create an album cover without showing you a bunch of album covers. So I'm going to flip through these. We're not going to spend a lot of time analyzing them, but I tried to pick a spectrum of album covers that cover uh, most genres of music. So um, I think they're kind of fun. So the album cover is fundamentally, if we look at it for a second, an album cover is a way of getting, right? You're do, let's say you're designing an album cover, okay? You're the designer. You're working on behalf of the artist. And you're designing it for the listener. You're trying to get that listener to listen to this album. So what you choose to put on the cover of the album really matters. So you want to think carefully about what goes on the cover. You know, some of these age well, some of them don't. Some of them are goofy. But these are designed to get you to listen to that particular piece of music. Sometimes there's multiple albums. I use this one as an example because there's a acoustic version, the same album, but treated differently. So the graphic design changed. All right, so these are all different styles, different albums. You know, now there's, there can be a graphic language that's similar across eras. And then there's some that don't age well. That being said, I do have to make my one caveat here. I saw Garth Brooks in concert and he was absolutely fantastic, even though he's old. So these are fundamentally ideas. They're albums to give you an idea to think about how you might create an album cover. What I'm going to ask that you do is I'm going to ask that you pick an artist that you like. Take that artist. Let me bring up the um, actual exercise here. Take that artist and you're going to create whatever their next album is. And we'll go through that process. You are using Photoshop here to correct the images, but you're dealing with the layout, the graphics in InDesign. We'll ultimately be exporting a JPEG and you'll um, send that, uh, or you upload that to Canvas, all right? So let's go ahead and let's open up InDesign and get a fundamental overview of InDesign. Let me minimize this here. All right, so I'm gonna open up the Adobe folder here and I'm gonna open up InDesign 2022. All right, so Adobe should look very similar. InDesign looks similar to, um, to Photoshop. It is an Adobe product. I'm going to skip through this what's new thing, and we'll just X out of that. And here in this kind of initial splash screen, we have to get started with 
the size piece of paper that we want to work with. And so you see that there's three presets, letter, iPad, and web. We're going to go into this more presets. And under the more presets, let's go into, let's try print, view all presets. Ah, there it is. So I went up here, we went over to print, and we came down here to a compact disc. I know people don't have compact discs anymore, but essentially we could do any square uh, piece of art, and that would be an album cover. Uh, but I'm going to pick the compact disc. And once I've picked that, I'm going to go ahead and click on this Create button. Before I do that, though, I just for my own sanity, I'm going to change the units out of being in picas into being in inches. It just bugs me. The, the picas are a, a, a unit that works for graphic designers and layout people. Me being an architecture person, I just need to work in inches. Um, so it's up to you. You can work in either, but I like to work in inches. I'm going to go ahead and click on Create. And we'll see that I get a square. Let me close this little splash screen here. So let's take a minute and let's look at what's happening in our InDesign window. And like I said, it looks a lot like Photoshop. So what we have on the very top here is we have our standard menu structure. So file, edit, layout, etc. We have a set of tools that run down the left side of the page here. These tools sometimes have tools underneath. So the type tool here, the T, if you click and hold, has the type on path tool. So if they have a little arrow next to them, they'll have a little sub tool underneath that you can work with. Okay. If we keep coming down here, we do have a fill color. And in the world of InDesign, rather than having a foreground color and a background color like we have in Photoshop, we have a fill color and we have what's called a stroke color. That's the outline color. And you can see it looks kind of like an outline there. So if I were to create an object right now, for example, right, it would have a black outline and it would be transparent in the middle. Okay, we have our rulers set up across the page. And then over on the right side, we have our basic properties. So over here, our basic properties about our pages, that includes our margins. And the margins, which you can see here, are this kind of pink and purple lines. And those are completely arbitrary. They're set at a half an inch in on this uh, template. And we really don't need those at a half an inch in. So I'm actually going to change the margins right here. I'll highlight this first margin, and I'll type in 0. Then I'm going to press the Tab key on the keyboard just to jump to the next field. Since they're linked together, when I change 1, they'll all change to 0. And now that, that margin is no longer a distracting factor. We've basically gotten rid of it. OK? So we're going to continue, and we're going to start working on it. Eventually, we're going to work on multiple page documents. For our purposes today, we're dealing with just a single page. So let's say that I want to create uh, a new album. And the first thing I need to do is I need to do some searching to find uh, an image for that album. So I'm going to use Unsplash. We've had good luck with Unsplash before. Oops, that was not what I wanted. Uh, where is it? Right, and I'm going to pick an image to use as my background. Right, so that one could be good. Let's go ahead and download this. So I'm going to click on the download, this little down arrow. We're going to choose the original size. So we have plenty of size there. And let's view it in its folder. OK, now this presents something that's interesting. The world of InDesign works off of referenced files. So we don't actually bring this file into our InDesign file. It's, it'll use this as a source when it does the export. So we actually need to copy this file and put it into our OneDrive before we lose it. So I'm going to take it, a right click, and say Copy. And I'm going to go into my OneDrive and into my folder for today.
And let's create a new folder here. I'll double click there and I'm going to paste that image into that folder. Okay, so now that I have that image on my OneDrive, we'll come back to InDesign. So the way InDesign works is that I create what's called a frame and then I can place an image into that frame. So let me click on the rectangular frame tool. It's like a rectangle with an X in it. And when I draw a frame, I get this little X. Within this frame, I can then place an image. So if I have this frame selected, I can go up to File and then Place right there. There's also Control D if you want to use the keyboard shortcut. And then I'll go to my flash drive and I'll find that file that we just saved. And there it is. And then I'll go ahead and click on Open. And you'll see that it shows up in here. It doesn't look very good. And that's because the image is much, much larger than what my frame is. So when I want to, to get my image to scale, I can right click on the image and I can go down to something called fitting right here. And I have several different options for fitting. I can fill frame proportionally. I can fit content proportionally. I can fit the frame to the content. I can fit the content to the frame. So let's look at these options. First one is fill frame proportionally. So when I click on that, it will fill whatever my frame is and keep the object or the, the photograph from getting skewed. Remember, because my photograph was much taller, my original. So that fits the image within the frame. My next option, if I go down here to fitting, Fit content proportionally is going to fit the whole image inside of my frame, but I'm going to end up with white space on either side. So there's my whole example. Let me undo here. Let me right click again and I'll go to fitting. Fit frame to content is going to make the frame way bigger. Right? I'd have to zoom out. Control, oops, sorry, this is supposed to be control minus. Right? So the image is, is gigantic. Let me undo. And then my last one, if I were to right click and go to fitting, would be the fit content to frame. And that's going to actually squish. Again, let me zoom in here. That's going to distort the image so that it, it fits, but we're going to end up with distortion. So the most common thing that you're going to use is probably the fit frame, fill frame proportionally, that one. Now, the neat thing about this is I can come back with my black tool here and I can adjust the frame after the fact. So I can make this taller and I'll get more image. I can make this one taller and I get more image. So it's kind of like it's cropping the image for me. If I double click on this, I can actually move the image inside of my frame. So the, again, these are just options. So in the case of making an album cover, I might find that I really want this to be the whole size of the page. So let's take my frame and let's move it out so that it becomes the whole size of the image. like that. Let me right click and say fitting. And we're going to fill frame proportionally. And there it is. Now, assuming I like the overall composition, we could leave it. I could also double click and adjust where that image is a little bit. Move that up till you get the right amount of beach. Okay, so let's say I like that right there. So I now have the image placed correctly. Now it's time to think about text. So we will cover text in a lot of detail. We'll talk about typography and type choice. But for right now, I'll click on the type tool. And we'll create a text box. 
And this is where I would type in, you know, the name of the artist, for example. So let's say, uh, I'll just use my own name right here, right? Now with the text, look over here on the properties on the right side, we can change the font. If I come here and I can pick any one of the fonts. All right, we could scroll down here and decide which font we like. Okay, then I can change the size. Here's the size. I can change the paragraph justification so I can make it align to the right. And when I like what I like, I could then move it like that. Don't be alarmed that this little blue box shows up. It's just telling us that's where the text is, right? Now, alternatively, if I didn't wanna do this, I could find a band logo. So I could come up here and we could do a, a Google search for a particular band logo. So let's pick, I don't know, Metallica. Right, and we want images, and we're looking for something like this, right? So if I like this logo, this would be hard to create with a font. We can go ahead and download it. So I'll download it. That's great. Let's go full resolution. Let me right click and save image as, and I'm gonna put it into that folder So let me go into today's folder. Okay, there's Metallica logo and I'll click save. Now with this Metallica logo, right? I would create a frame. Can't you just right, okay. uh, drag the logo to the picture instead of making so we, the frame? Yes, but I would rather make the frame first because I can control how large the image is. If I were to just drag it in, or for example, I were to place it in without the frame selected, when I go to file and then place, it's going to bring it in full size, right? And this may or may not be a problem with this image. Let's see how big it is. Yeah, there it is. So I'd be zooming out and then trying to resize this to see my whole image. So I'd come over here to the resize tool and then I'd be trying to shrink this thing down until it's the right size. So it's a lot more work. If, however, I drew my frame first like this, and I went to file and then place, and I drop that image in here, I can, with the frame already existing, I can right click, go to fitting, and then fill frame proportionally, and I'm gonna get the whole logo. It's a lot less work and a lot less steps. Okay. So. When I did that though, you'll see that I'm not particularly, oops, sorry, that was Mac commands instead of Windows commands. Um, I don't really like this because I've got the black background and the white letters. So here's where Photoshop comes in, right? Remember, we worked in Photoshop before. So let's open that image in Photoshop. So I'm gonna right click on it. I'm gonna go to open with Photoshop. And there it is. And now I can work on this in Photoshop. So we did previously, we worked on um, isolating an image. So we can do the same thing. So I could come in here and I could select the back background. I'm gonna do that with a select and then color range because it's black and white. It's really easy to pick just the black background. So I sample the black background. I say, okay. And it, it basically highlights the back black background for me. Let me go ahead and um, I could do a layer mask. I could add a layer mask. So we'll click on the add layer mask. Although I think I have to invert the selection. Yeah, because that cut it out the wrong way. So let me go back to my select and then inverse. There we go. Then we'll add the layer mask. And now that becomes transparent. 
So at this point, if I went to file, export, export as, and I saved a PNG, that's a PNG, we'll export. I have to get it on my uh, flash drive again here. There it is. Now, if I came back to InDesign, I can actually replace this with the new image that I created. So with it selected, I can go to file and then place, or I could go to view and then, uh, excuse me, window and then links. There's that Metallica logo. And I could actually come down here with it selected and choose to relink it. And I could then pick my, um, my new image. There's my new image like that. Now, if I didn't like the fact that this was white because it's too hard to see, right? I could easily move it over here, in which case you could see it. But if I didn't like that, uh, we could come back to Photoshop and we could change this and, and make this black, for example, and then bring it back in to InDesign. So just don't forget that you can make these adjustments in Photoshop and then bring your images in. Right, so let's leave the logo there this time, right? And now maybe we need, uh, how about a parental advisory? Why not? So what I do is I go find, again, I come back to my browser here. Just a moment, when, yep. you, change it, when you change it to black, you need to cut all, uh, all each of the letters in order to uh, add, uh, brush with, uh, use sure. a black brush? Sure. Let's go back to Photoshop. Okay, so in this case, we already have our, um, our cutout. So all I have to do is change this so that it's in black. And I could do that by using the paintbrush with black as my foreground color to make the brush big. There we go. Ah, because we you already it. cut it, okay. Because I already cut it out, I already have a mask. Yeah, okay. So I can easily go through and change it into black. So there it is in black. Let's go to file, export, export as. It's the PNG, we'll export uh, and we'll call this black. There we go. Then I could jump over into InDesign and we could replace this again. So I can click on it, go over to my links and replace it with the black logo instead. And there it is in black, which obviously would belong more in that ballpark. Maybe it needs to be a little bit smaller. So I'll shrink the frame down and then right click, go to fitting, fill frame proportionally, and there it is. So just other options, okay? So the last part was the parental guidance. So let's open up Chrome here. And Parental advisory PNG. So we could use, you know, any one of these. I'm just looking for, you know, let's use this one. Visit it. I'm going to right click, uh, maybe. Uh, no, I'm not seeing where I can download it. Download, maybe that's it. I think I have to wait long enough for it to download. Maybe not. Um, oh, there it is. All right, I am not a robot. Download. I don't know, I don't know. Well, anyway, I already have it. The point is there's, there's a, a bunch of other ones. So we ought to be able to, any one of these, we ought to be able to get. The ads are killing me here. Okay, here we go. Save image as. Oh, look, I already downloaded it. 
Uh, let's go here. Let's go to my folder for today. Remember, I'm being very careful to save everything in my folder. And that's a key to InDesign because if you don't save everything, you're going to end up with problems. And then I can bring that in. So once again, I'll create the frame first. All right, there's the frame. I'll go to File and then Place. There's that parental advisory. I'll right click and go to fitting. Well, I'm gonna fit content proportionally so I get the whole thing this time. And then we'll go ahead and we'll move this, oops, sorry. We'll move my frame over here and we'll stick that little parental advisory down over there. Sorry, what's the difference between fit content and fit frame? So if I, it, it's a good, great question. So um, if I were to fill this proportionally, so let me right click and say fitting, fill frame proportionally, it's, um, no, it didn't work that time. Uh, it can cut off pieces of it because like this image in the background, we're cutting off a bunch up above. The fit content um, inside frame, make sure that the whole content fits inside the frame. Um, so it's just different ways of, of getting to the same place. Um, let me move this over. Actually, you know what? Let me right click. I'm going to go to fitting. We'll fill frame proportionally. There it is. I'm going to right click and I'm going to go to fitting and we're going to uh, fit frame to content. And this is because I have extra space around it. I want to get this a little bit tighter. Can I use shift? I in order to change the, the picture uh, proportionally? Something like that, I, I heard uh, about it. Yes, so in, in the fitting, no. If we were using this tool right here, which is the free transform tool, at that point, if you wanna stay proportional, you would hold down shift and it'll make your image larger or smaller. If I were doing it just with the arrow tool, I'd be cutting off part of my image. Okay. So if you want to resize something after you have it set, use this tool right here, which is the free transform tool. Right. All right. So I'll set that one up there. And I know I'm almost out of time for today. And when I'm all done, so let's say I like this, I can go to file and then I'm going to go to save. So file, save. I'm going to put this on my flash drive in its folder. So let me go into live demonstrations here. Right, and so this is album. And this is going to save an InDesign document. That saves all the layout information so I can open it up and edit it again. When I create the piece that I'm gonna post, I would be going to file and then export. And we're gonna be exporting by default, it comes up with a PDF because a lot of times what we're exporting is a PDF. We want a JPEG. So I'm gonna change the format down here to JPEG and it's called album cover, and we'll go ahead and click on save. It will bring up export options. This is important. Under image quality, we wanna make this one maximum, and we wanna change our resolution from 72 to 300. If you don't change it, your end product will end up blurry. We'll go ahead and export, and now I have my final version. The nice thing about that final version is that all those blue lines here have disappeared and we can see our final album cover. Maybe if it'll open for me, there it is, where everything's all connected together. This is what I would end up posting on the on Canvas for your exercise 109. All right, I know it's a bit of a shift. I know you can get through it. So have some fun with this. This is meant for you to have fun, pick a fun band, do something that, that looks creative. Um, and then we'll continue working with InDesign and kind of developing our design skills. We'll talk about fonts and typography. We'll talk about more advanced layout techniques, et cetera. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share. At this point, I'm done with lecture. Remember, we do have check-ins this week. So if you didn't come on Monday, I need you to come back, come today. Uh, our first session will start at 9.10 because it's nine o'clock right now. I'm right on time. Uh, so I'll see you back in about 10 minutes, or you're welcome to stay on uh, in the meantime. 
Would you mind if I ask a question now? Sure, about go ahead. Uh, yeah, regarding the regarding the logo, when you changed it from 75 to 300 dots yep. per inch, I noticed that the diagonal lines got smoother. And I'm also wondering if vectorizing that logo would make a difference. Yes, vectorizing the logo does make a difference. So if I were able to, I'm going to share my screen one more time here. Hold on. If I were able to use a vector-based logo instead, no matter what size I output, it would be perfect. But this brings up a really good point, and that is that InDesign shows us an approximation of this image. So the image, see how it looks a little pixelated? And when we come up here to, oops, come on. My logo, the edges look pixelated. That's because InDesign is showing us a preview. It's not actually showing us the full resolution. And it doesn't matter on a single page, but if you imagine a 200 page book or a magazine where there's all kinds of images, it can slow down the computer quite a bit. So they show us this previewed image. If you wanna see it in better um, mode, you know, where it's clearer, you can right click on your image and you can go to display performance and choose high quality display. And that should then sharpen it up. It doesn't always work in preview. Let's see if it'll do it on this one. There we go. See how it sharpened everything up? Yeah. So you can do it. Let me go to display performance. Let's see if I can uh, high quality display. There we go. I just sharpened that one up too. Know that once you do the export, however, regardless of what it looks like here, so I don't have to change this. It could be actually we could take it all the way to uh, fast display, which gives us these X's instead. Uh, when I go and do the export, it's always going to take the highest resolution that it can. So whatever we start with as our um, background, and it'll give us that resolution. So whoops, sorry. So our export at 300, there's still a little bit of pixelation there when we zoom in. We could export at 600 and it would be a little bit smoother. If this were a vector, when we export, it would be perfect every time. Is there a way to easily take a rasterized logo and vectorize it in Photoshop? Uh, not in Photoshop, but in Illustrator, yes. Okay. So I can show you that. Uh, we'll get to it a little bit later on in the semester, but if it's something you want to know now, I'll, I'll jump and I'll, I'll show it to you. Um, well, sure, why not? I'll show it to you now. Worst case is you can just ignore it or the other people on the, on the Zoom can ignore it. Um, if we open up Illustrator, which we haven't even covered yet. There we go. Got to give it a second to open up here. Then we want to open up that um, that logo. So I'll go to open, and we'll go into my folder here. <coughs> and where are we here? Okay, let's use this black one here. Come on, Illustrator. There we go. Um, let me hold on. I got it. All right, let's, uh, I need to make this smaller so that it actually fits. So uh, let's shrink this guy down a little bit. Okay, so now it's on there. So if I want to take this and I want to vectorize it, essentially, we, we would go up to object and we choose something called image trace. And then we choose make. Uh, we'll go ahead and say, okay. And it will then trace over the object for us. There are options for image tracing, uh, which didn't appear. When, uh... There we go. Um, where you can change different, they have different presets. So depending, like this is a black and white logo. So we can choose, and then you can choose, there's a threshold for, for how it traces. It actually did an awfully good job right now. Um, and when I'm done, I'll click this button for expand. 
and you'll see that it will then create a vector object. Let me get rid of the background because it does the background where all of these are actual vectors. So it's a pretty painless process for something like this where it's sharp to begin with, but this is now a vector based logo and we could use this in, in place of, and no matter how many times we zoom in, it's always gonna be sharp. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you chose. It's under, it would bring the image in to Illustrator yeah. and then you go to object, image, trace, and then make. It's gonna work really well with like a black and white image like mm -hmm. this. If, if it's not a black and white image, it can be a little bit more challenging to do this image trace. Uh, in that case, if you go to window and then choose to show the image trace window, it will give you presets and options that'll help you create better results. And you can actually kind of jump through and preview it. And this is a bad example because it's an, it's an easy one to trace. Well, that's, that's okay. Yeah. If so, and then you chose black and white in the modes and. And it that... created that or black and white logo in it. And it was able to create a vector based graphic from the raster graphic and so it's it's vectorized now if i just save this so right so a... we would need to save this as a vector format so when i go to save as uh excuse me export and then export as instead of exporting it as a jpeg or a png we would want to export it as like an svg for example because that's a vector format file so i could save it as an svg uh we'll put it in here and i'll go ahead and click on export uh, i'm just double checking yeah all of that's fine let's go ahead and say okay and then when we came back to indesign on this logo here we would want to place in let me just replace it here we would want to replace it with the svg which I'm not sure which one is the SVG. <laughs> Probably that one. Let me see here. There's, oops, SVG. The only purpose yeah. of the vectorite is just to make the structure smoother or it's made in, oh, it, it, it would mean that I could export this graphic way larger and it would stay perfectly smooth. It's not dependent on the um the excuse me this logo is not dependent on the original size of the the logo that i created in photoshop anymore so i can scale it up infinitely and the edges will always be sharp they won't ever be pixelated so the whole the whole concept this is we're we're like three weeks ahead of where <laughs> where we need to be we're talking about uh vector and raster graphics that's coming i promise but i wasn't ready to talk about it fully yet yeah sorry about um, that. It no it's just... okay it's good that you know this is why we do these things and i would be i'm happy to answer the questions it doesn't hurt but there is a distinct difference between vector graphics and raster graphics and there's a reason that we use uh the vector graphics when we can in certain areas and so on something like a logo, you would want the logo to be in vector graphics because you can blow it up the size of a billboard and it would still be sharp on the edges. That's where the advantage comes in. Oh, thank you for covering that. Yeah, so we'll cover it again. So if 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 you if you got a little lost, don't panic. Um, but it's you know it's obviously it's designed to uh, to help you now <laughs> if you want it. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Perfect. All right, you guys that are still on, give me a second to pull up my, uh, I'm going to stop my share and then I need to get my roll up so I can give you guys attendance credit. So hang on, let me get organized here. <laughs> 